This episode contains discussion about sexual assault and domestic violence. Listener discretion is advised. Today, we're discussing episode six, which is titled, Like Angels Put in Hell by God. Let's jump right into the episode with director Levin Akin. He's a Swedish filmmaker who wrote and directed the film And Then We Danced, a queer drama about the world of dance that received a 15-minute standing ovation at Cannes in 2019. What have you done today? Also, he is a huge Anne Rice fan. Who could be better for the job? Levin, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Thank you, Naomi, for having me. Look, I have a lot of hard-hitting questions. Okay. But first, in this episode, there's a heated discussion about whether or not Emily Dickinson is a vampire. What other historical figures do you think were most likely vampires? Oh, oh, that's a very good question. Um, Yeah, I want to say perhaps Tesla. Oh, could have, he could have okay. been a vampire. He Why? could be a vampire. Why Nikola maybe. Tesla? Tell me. What are you thinking? I don't know. Maybe I'm just thinking about, was it David Bowie who played him in a movie? Maybe that, I just got that image in my <laughs> well, head. I, I don't know, but also, yes, Bowie is vampiric. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe mm-hmm. Bowie. Mm-hmm. I don't know. What do you think? You know, I've, I'm not used to having the tables turned in this way, Levin. Oh. Okay? So, <laughs> am I, I don't know if I'm ready. I don't know if I'm ready. I think, I think Bowie and Iman are both very good ones. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. Iman for sure. Oh. <laughs> Oh, and also Grace Jones, but she's yes, still around. of course. I mean, for I mean Grace yeah. Jones at the Hollywood Bowl in her seventies, hula hooping. Honey, I can't even stand up for more than ten minutes. Oh wow, amazing! No, that's fantastic. I know. Obviously, you understand the vamps, okay? That you go way back. Can you tell me about when you first discovered Anne Rice? I'd heard about her, and then I saw the film. So that was my first, and I was, I think I was 14. Oh, wow. Okay, formative. Formative. Yeah, Mm -hmm. very formative. So I I remember that screening very well, and I loved vampires, I loved films, and then I saw that film, and, you know, I was this little gay kid who, you know, there was a lot of subtext in that movie that I could pick up. And then I remember going to my school library and f- I found the Vampire Lestat. Mm. And I was like, ooh. So actually that was the first book I read, The Vampire Lestat. Okay. Yeah, it was a game changer for me. And then I read all the books and I was pretty much obsessed. Perhaps too early, you know, for a kid to read that. <laughs> I think it was like 15 uh-huh. or something. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember your parents having any reaction to you reading these books? <laughs> like a little teen and you're like, in the corner with the vampire Lestat. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, they didn't really get it. Like, my parents are, we're, we're originally from Georgia, the former Soviet Republic. So they had no reference to Anne Rice or to pop culture in that sense. Maybe I was like 12 or 13. I, I wanted Madonna's sex book for my birthday. <laughs> Uh, and I got it. And they were like, oh, okay. You know, because they didn't get it. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> okay, so your parents are immigrants who have worked hard to give you a better life, to give you opportunities. Yes. Yes. And you said, give me sex book. You <laughs> said, this is what I want. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I know, right? Uh, it's it's pretty fantastic. <laughs> but, you know, that's what they fought for. That's what they worked hard for, yep. in a way. <laughs> Okay, you're coming to us live from Sweden. Correct me if I'm wrong, but Interview with a Vampire is your first time directing a U.S. TV series? Yes, yes. Tell me everything. Levin, how does it happen? How are you out here working in Sweden and you're like, get me on the Anne Rice show? Yeah, I mean, it is really weird and I still can't believe it. (laughs) So how did it happen? Well, I did a film called And Then We Danced and that sort of opened some doors for me. And... I got agents and then I uh, read on like an Anne Rice fan page that I'm following on Facebook yeah. that they were going to do a TV series of Into the Vampire. And I just emailed my agents and I told them, get me on that show. Wow. Wow. And they were like, huh? Okay. <laughs> and then finally I met Rollin Jones mm-hmm. and I was very nervous. But luckily Rollin thought that, hey, why not, you know, give this guy a a try. He was a risk taker, (laughs) Rollin. It's pretty crazy. I mean, it's so cool. I mean, the first thing that I find impossible is that an agent was useful. Amazing. (laughs) 
Yes. I was just, you know, walking around pinching myself every day. I was like forgetting that I was there to direct. I was like, it, <laughs> it was a really a special moment for me. And, and, you know, I also got to do when they first, when Louis first meets Molloy in San Francisco. Can you imagine? I got to do I that know. scene. That's crazy. Oh my you know, God. I, I still can't believe it. I, I can't believe I was even there. It's crazy. I'm like very happy yeah. for you. I'm because I'm very happy for the 14 year old in you. Because that is huge. Thank the you. idea of you know something that opens your mind up, opens your heart up, and makes you start to think about what's possible for yourself. You know. Yeah, I mean th- those books were my escape. She showed me a world, like she showed me a queer world. She showed me these characters. She showed me that the world was bigger than you know I knew, and 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 you know it brought me all the way to actually being in her world and and directing. It it was very it was such a special moment, and also just now talking to you, Naomi, about it, it's you know it's it's really strange to me. Not only did you get to you know as you said it was a pinch me moment. You directed episodes five and six, which are the most tumultuous episodes for me in the in the show and the most tumultuous time in louis and lestat's relationship Mm. what is the core of the conflict how would you describe it in these episodes you know those two episodes are essentially sort of the the darkest days it's very much everything comes to its end things will never be you know what they used to be and i remembered reading episode five and by the end of that episode, I was thinking, how, how, how does Lestat ever come back from this? And then I started reading episode six and, you know, how he sort of slowly tears Louis down in a way and just talks his way back into their lives. And I thought it was brilliant, but also, you know, uh, frightening. Mm-hmm. Louis, I don't know what possessed me that night. I was someone I don't want to be anymore. I've changed. I'm nothing without you. I'm nothing without both of you. This silence is cruel. And you are never cruel, Louis. I, I always I tried to approach the material from, you know, a point of, and, and I know they're going to laugh now, the actors, because I said this so much, but like, what's the reality of the situation, you know? How do we react in these situations? Because, you know, it is a toxic relationship. Mm -hmm. It was very interesting to, you know, approach these scenes as an adult, having read these Mm -hmm. books as a kid. Yeah. That was very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was also a little dramatic child, right? And when you would read these romances, it seemed, I want someone to love me that much. And then when you're an adult, on the flip side, you're like, this is sick. This is twisted. We have to yeah. have boundaries. Right? Exactly. Like, yes, of course. You see the kind of your, your relationship to it change. And as you said, sort of for all the fantasy of it, the emotions are real regardless of the time. Precisely. How do we stay in the truth of what the feelings are? Mm. Because this episode, as we say, you know, this is a tumultuous time. This is the point of no return, the darkest of days. And we see Lestat begging for forgiveness over the course of years, trying to win Louis back. And he has just a real messed up way of apologizing. He had engaged a local record company. And when the musicians they hired proved unsatisfactory, he played all the instruments himself. That's his voice. Yeah. He pressed only one album. Had the master recordings destroyed. You're listening to an inferior re-recording now. The audacity of it all was matched only by its sincerity. He had made the near-perfect Valentine with one flaw. Pathetic. One perfectly premeditated flaw. Six years of begging, you think a song's gonna get a rise out of me? Did you like it? This her sing? It's a clear voice, I wanted no obstacle to the lyric. Uh. Write me a song, put your lover's voice on it. What the fuck is wrong with your hair? Your ear's soaking wet. I swim faster than I drive. You swim the Mississippi to find me? 
Lestat. Lestat. I mean, can we talk a little bit about, you know, as a director, getting into the mindset, right? Because for the character of Louis, it's been years, right, since he's faced Lestat. And then we see this moment. When you're talking to Jacob and Sam, how do you kind of work with them to get in that mindset of like, okay, it's been six years. You swam the Mississippi. Bring me that energy. Rolling. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. No. I mean, again, how do you find the truth in a scene like that? It's essentially at the core of it, a lover's reuniting. Right. But also there is so much frustration coming from Louis in that scene where he's you know, been having this stalker, essentially, Mm. slowly nudging his way back into his life. I remember talking to Jacob about it when we were having lunch. I think in that scene, it feels as if also he's had enough. He knows in a way that he's never going to be free of Lestat. And he also Mm. says that later on. It's like, he he, he might as well just relent. You know, it's very sad. Toward the end of that episode, he, he tells Claudia that, you know, what difference does it make? Right. I know. That was so sad. That was so heartbreaking to it's me. So you know, when sad. he when he yeah, when to me Claudia's too. like, look, he's still seeing Antoinette. And yeah. and Louis is like, What does it matter? It's like, oh, Louis, honey, this is the problem. I want everyone to have better self esteem. I do too. I want Louis to realize he can do better. <laughs> me too. But but you know, the stats his prison. Mm-hmm. This mm-hmm. book and and then his and, and this whole season is like him trying to get over a bad breakup. That's what it's about essentially. Right. And he's still, you know, uh, what is it? 100 years later, you know, you're still trying to sort of understand and deal with what happened in this relationship. That's pretty interesting, I think. Yeah, no, definitely. And you see here that it's like 2022 Mm. and he's still mad. Yeah. Relatable. Relatable. I've (laughs) definitely been mad at people for 100 years. (laughs) You know what I mean? Of course, of course. And, and, And he, you know, Lestat made him a vampire you know, he became in a way his his everything. That's all he has. All you know, he became isolated from his family, his friend. They all died off. He has nothing. Yeah. You know, it is classic abusive, toxic. He's isolated, Louis. Yeah. Well, this brings me actually to a really important scene, as well as a voicemail we got from a podcast listener. Levin, the listeners are calling oh, in. Oh wow! They're calling in. They've got thoughts. Fantastic. Let's listen to this voicemail so we can get into it. Hi, Naomi. I did watch the first episode. I was very intrigued. I did not read the book. The only thing was I didn't understand why Louis' brother killed himself. And then I thought, well, maybe Lestat had gotten into his head because he wants Louis so badly, but he wants Louis to come to him. So what better way to get someone and get into someone's head by killing a loved one and they're in mourning. And at that point, they're vulnerable. So anyway, I just wanted to know if that was why uh, Louis' brother killed himself because Lestat put that in his head so that he could get to Louis. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you for calling in. You know I love when people leave voicemails. And you're asking the question that Louis asks in this episode. Did you have anything to do with Paul's death? No. I would never hurt your brother. It's just something I always... Never, Louis. I thought this was such a huge moment. Like, when he asked that question, my, my like I was like, oh, my God. Have you been sitting on this for 30 years? Mm. You know what I mean? Like, have you been with this mm. person wondering this all this time? Mm. I thought that was like huge. Can you tell me like your thoughts on that question? Like, yes. He says so, no. He says no. He says no. You know, him having had this question, like you say, for 30 years and never asked before. What does that mean? Does it mean that he had his doubts But he never wanted to ask because he didn't want the truth. And now when he sort of, you know, they're standing at this threshold and he's like, I'm going to ask that question. But I think that Lestat did not have anything to do with it, actually. I think he's Mm. telling the truth. Uh, That's what I think. Interesting. What do you think? It is so tricky to me because we know Lestat is a manipulator, Mm. right? Like that's sort of 
that's what he does. And so it's, this is a real tough one for me. On one hand, the way he responds, I'm like, yes, I believe that. But at the same time, he did get in Paul's head at the dinner table. But if he did do it, he's unredeemable in a way. Yeah, that's true. Which is why I think he did not do it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Who made you? His name was Magnus. He took me from my room in Paris as I kicked and screamed. He kept me for a week, locked in a room full of corpses. Some freshly killed, some bloated and black. But they all looked like me. My coloring, my physique. My own eyes, staring back at me from rotting faces. He fed on me every night. And then he'd put me back in the tower with their lookalike corpses. I thought for sure I'd be one of them, but instead he turned me into this. No grand history of vampiric origins or physiology, no rules, no counsel. Just a sweeping hand to a pile of money and the sight of him throwing himself into a fire. And then I was alone. I cried. I called to God. I didn't want this, but I have a capacity for enduring. It's why I don't particularly like being abandoned. Oh my God, (laughs) Sam Reed. I swear to God. Yes. My big question is, why do you think Lestat is telling his story now? To me, I think it's that he has to give something at this moment. Like he knows that he has to give them something to be able to move forward. So I think it's purely tactical. Uh And he's very sort of earnest when he tells it. You know, it feels very down to earth and it's not, you know, as flamboyant as he usually is. It's very sort of grounded and and, and, and direct. Right. Was that something you and Sam talked about when looking at this monologue? Mm -hmm. We talked about it and we said that this has to be different. It has to feel different for you to sort of lay that final punch toward Louis and actually winning him over for real, you know, without right. a doubt. Right, right, right. Because you don't want, we, I don't want the audience to feel that Louis is an idiot. You know what I mean? Like it has, you, you have to understand that Louis is like, okay, like he finally gave me something truthful and something real. Yes. He's being vulnerable. Speaking of sort of this intimacy and this question of the toxicity of this relationship, do you think Lestat deserves forgiveness? This is an an interesting question because I was thinking about it. You know, when you read the books and when you read uh, The Vampire Lestat, A Queen of the Damned, you know, it's told from Lestat's perspective. So in a way, he's sort of manipulating the reader and you really love him and he's amazing and you're like inside his mind and he motivates all of his, you know, bad decisions and all of the bad stuff he does, you know, because you understand him. And when you see him objectively like this from the outside, you see him with different eyes Mm -hmm. and it becomes more complicated, I think. And also this is Louis' retelling of Lestat. Right. I think the question for me is more, does Louis really forgive him? I'm not sure that he does. I mean, he takes Mm. him in again, but is he totally open to him? Or are, you know, has he locked off some places? Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Right? You got to lock off Yeah, you got to lock off. You yeah, got to lock off sure. some places with Lestat. For sure. And you can see that in relationships, I feel, you know, that people who have been together for too long, where you're like, do they really, are they really, should they really, what's going on here? Or is it just, you know, they're comfortable and it's easier like this and you just keep going. Right, right. Lestat will not let him go. And we also see he won't let Claudia go. I hate him yeah why why won't he just let claudia go because to me one of the things i find so tough to understand is that lestat never wanted claudia he made her to appease Mm. louis and so to me i'm like yes why wouldn't lestat let her go so he can have louis all to himself again because that's all he wants because he knows that that he's never going to be enough for for louis i think I think that, you know, he doesn't want, he knows that Louis is going to be depressed, that he's going to be 
thinking about Claudia and he just doesn't want to rock the status quo of the situation. He just wants to keep it as as is. Yeah. Because it's going to be trouble for uh, Lestat. Mm -hmm. Don't you think? Well, I don't know. I feel like Lestat is his own trouble. If yeah. he could just be nice yeah. and stop having side pieces. Because yeah. here's my other thing too. It kills me. Mm. When he mentions this Bruce thing, and knowing what we know of Lestat and how vengeful he is, how destructive he is, why didn't he go kill Bruce? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. And that made me very, like, I just felt like, oh, so you knew all this time? Yeah. And we all know you like to hurt people just for fun. Could you go kill Bruce for the family? Please? I was mad. Yeah, me too, actually. This was tough. One of the things I found interesting in this, too, was the idea of enduring mm. comes up, right? Especially from Lestat. Like, he's like, I endure. Or he goes, we endure each other as he says to Claudia in this. And in a lot of ways, too, Louis is sort of enduring mm. Lestat, saying basically, what else can I do? So I'm just going to kind of stay with him. Is enduring something to even be proud of? Doesn't sound great to me. I agree. I think it's, you know, it's like a, a way of suffering. But I see it almost as a duty to go through these things. And, and like you say, to endure you know, being a vampire, living forever, essentially, is in itself an endurance. Mm -hmm. So I think in this context, you know, Louis is saying, what is the point? This is, my, this is all I have. I, you know, there, he doesn't know any other vampires. He doesn't know anything else. You know, why not just endure this? And just, you know, let this pass. Because like, mm -hmm. I think you see time differently if you live forever. So it's like, what is 10, you know, it's going to be 10 bad years maybe, but then things are going to yeah. change. And I mean, you're right, but it's just funny where you're like, 10 bad years, what's one bad decade? Sure. When you have hundreds sure. of years Because you don't live. really have this sort of, as we do, or as I do, where it's like, it's now or never. Like, right. I got to get my shit together. I got to do this now because I'm like, you know, pushing 45 or whatever. And, you know, you're just like really hustling to try to like fulfill all your dreams. But then it's like, but then what do you do? Right, I can really feel that in in also these episodes, and especially episode six. He's like, "What's the point? I we might as well endure this and try to make the best of this because this is what we have. These are the cards that we've been dealt." Well, that brings me to Malloy. You know, in present day, when Louis is offering Malloy eternal life, and Malloy turns it down so quickly, yeah, which we know is not what it was like in San Francisco in the 70s. I interpret it as having heard this story, he is like, oh, this actually doesn't sound great. I do not want to be a vampire, right? Yeah. Like now kind of knowing what he knows, he's like, no, thank you. <laughs> of course, of course. And I also think, you know, being older and having seen, you know, what a effed up place the world is and everything is going to hell and they're, you know, they're in the middle of the pandemic and, you know, climate change and wars and everything. I think Malloy's like, I don't want to stay here. Like, come on. Right, right. Well, this episode ends with, you know, honey, I don't know. Is Malloy having a dream? Mm. Is he having a memory? Like, I live for a camera pan over. I love when a camera pans and reveals something. And then he's there. I love that too. I screamed. Oh, you did? End. That's I amazing. Screamed. I freaked I out did. when I was reading it too. I was like, Oh, my God. Yes. This character who's been just in the background, quietly attractive, but not telling us too much. Mm. I know you can't tell me any more about that final scene with Rashid, so I won't even try. Lucky for you, I give up easy. But before you leave, I wanted us to end with my favorite segment, A Little Taste. Now, of course, without giving away any spoilers for the big finale, can you give us a little taste of what's to come? <laughs> Yes. This series is like everything I wished for as a fan. You know, you just wanted somebody to come in and do these books justice. And I mean, there's so many amazing things that are going to happen in this series moving forward that I know, you know, that are in the books that is so cool. That you're going to freak out. Like it's like you, it's it's crazy. It's it's just so much fun stuff that's going to happen. And so many things that Rollin has, you know, planted now that's gonna come later um, and yeah, be revealed later. That's, it's really cool. 
Oh my goodness. Oh, Levin, thank you so, so much for coming and talking to me. This was wonderful. I really appreciate you taking the time and telling me everything. Thank you. It was so lovely. It was really wonderful. 